Today's episode of The Overwhelmed Brain is brought to you by EverlyWell. Get 15% off your EverlyWell at home lab test by visiting everlywell.com forward slash brain. And make sure to enter the promo code BRAIN during checkout to get the discount. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello, welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. My name is Paul Coliani, and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction, handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. Got an interesting email I'd like to read to you a few months back. Um, it's something that maybe some of us deal with, perhaps at a home, perhaps at work, and it's dealing with somebody who's, I don't know, kind of smart and snarky and maybe condescending. It's like when you know someone that puts you down without really putting you down. It's when they say things to you or you're talking with them and you leave the conversation feeling bad in some way. Not necessarily emotionally abusive, but they have a way of putting you down and you end up feeling bad from the things they said because you perhaps feel small, inferior, um, less self-worth, less self-esteem. They say things in a way that they come out on top and you feel like, you have been put in your place, so to speak. I mean, this does happen in emotionally abusive relationships where the other person will just find ways to manipulate and coerce you and make you feel bad about yourself. But these are the people that you might have a good relationship with otherwise, and maybe they're loving or kind and supportive in many ways, but they say things in a way that make you feel bad. I don't know how else to say it. They, they make you feel unhappy in some way or even rejected in some way. So I'm going to read you the email and it'll make more sense when I read it, but I'll make some comments on it because this person had a question on this very thing. This person I'll call Joan. Joan says, any thoughts or suggestions for someone, myself, who is married to a mental health professional is great with words, convincing, and makes you feel like you can never measure up. He says that he isn't saying that I never measure up, but in reality, that's how I feel. He'll tell me I'm a 99% great wife, but the 1% I lack is the emotional needs he has. If I give him my full attention and time, and I do nothing else but give him that time and attention for a while, he calms down, but I feel more controlled than loved or had my needs met. I struggle because we've been married a number of years and we've built a business together. So if I leave, there's nothing really for me because he makes the money. He's a mental health professional and knows all the right things to say to me to make me feel like I've done wrong without actually saying it. He's not one to show any feelings in public unless I say something in front of others he doesn't like. But then I get that look and I get a lecture later. I'm also not allowed to talk to anyone about anything between us. I do see a therapist and share with her Sorry to ramble. There's a ton I could share that I have so many questions about. Okay, Joan, thank you for sharing that. And I think a lot of us can relate to that. I can relate to that in my own relationship, not to the extent you're talking about, but, um, you know, my girlfriend's very smart (laughs) and, uh, she will have arguments that put me in my place unless I'm really thinking on my feet. And, I've learned to kind of navigate through these arguments uh, so that I don't feel like I've completely lost. Not that I'm trying to win, but you don't want to feel completely 
unsupported, unloved. It's, it's not exactly what happens in my arguments, but the arguments that we've had, and they're not that many, but every now and then something will come up and she will state her case in a way that sounds completely rational, logical, and right. And I'm stuck trying to get around her logic or get through her logic some way. And I don't like the feeling of it. It feels very defeating. And it takes a lot of brain energy to get into that space to have the kind of conversation that helps me navigate through that. So I'm I'm telling you this in a way to hopefully help you understand that I relate to you. And like I said, I'm not relating to you at the level that you're at, but I understand what can happen because people can do that. People can come up with a way to explain something that puts you back on the defense, back in a space of, huh, I don't necessarily know how to come back at you with something that makes sense or that you'll accept as a good reason but I do know that what you're doing to me right now makes me feel bad. It feels like you're putting me in my place. And I also know at a deeper level that I'm right about this. And I'm not trying to put you down. I know I'm right about this. I just want to convey that message. But I can't. Because you come back at me with some argument or some logical thing that now I have to get disentangled from this logical puzzle that you put in front of me. Uh, just to convey my message. And so, you know, this sounds a little complex and it can be, but I like to break things down. If I'm in a situation like this where my girlfriend or anyone comes at me with a lot of logical arguments and I feel like you just can't hear me, you're not understanding what I'm saying, let me convey to you this message. And I convey that message, but instead of hearing it, they come back with something else that puts me on the defense again or makes me feel bad or something like that. And again, it doesn't have to be someone that's doing it intentionally. It's just maybe the way they debate or argue and that's that. So you have to work with it. So what can you do to work with it? One of the things that I do is I try to step out of both sides because clearly what I'm saying isn't getting through and what they're saying is hitting me the wrong way. So I like to step out of that conversation, not that I leave the room, but I step out of the logic that's going on in the moment and try to come at it at a different angle. So one of the first things I like to do is uh, realize that my message isn't getting through using the perspective, using the angle I'm using. So I'm going to say this another way. So that can be one way to redo the conversation. And you might even want to say that, look, I can't get through to you. You can't get through to me. Let's try to approach this another way. And hopefully if you have someone understanding, and in your case, Joan, since he's in the mental health field, he should have the ability to listen and really take in what you're saying and even convey back what you're saying as a mental health professional would. Hopefully that's the case. It doesn't always work that way because sometimes people aren't the same way they are at work as they are at home. Sometimes they don't treat their clients the same way they do their loved ones. So you have to deal with a different side of them. But it can be helpful if you have someone that says, okay, you're right. Let's look at this a different way. You tell me what's going on inside of you, what your side is, and then I will come back with perhaps a different angle that you can understand. So that's just one thing you can do. It probably won't work to tell you the truth because when you believe you're right, you're still going to push that onto someone else. And let's just say that he really believes he's right no matter what. And he's just giving you some space to share something else only to come back at you with his whatever righteousness or belief that he knows he's right. And he's just going to tell you in a different way, but he's still not going to give you the opportunity to explain yourself in the way you want to explain yourself. So You take that first suggestion of stepping out of that current logic and creating a new logic puzzle, if you want to call it that, or new argument or new debate, and just give a different perspective. And one way to do that, one way to give a different perspective is to reference something in the other person's life that they can use as an analogy. And what that might mean is saying something like, you know, honey, 
when you have a client in front of you and they say this. And now he can relate. You know, and now I can relate because I'm in that field. So yes, go ahead. Uh, what else you got? I mean, continue on with what you're saying. Okay, uh, what would you say to that client when your client said this? Now, this helps him connect with you in an empathetic way because now he's experiencing it through his own brain. He is trying on your shoes, except he's actually wearing his own shoes and talking to you through his own experience. And the same can be had with him doing the same with you. If he wants to convey a message, he can use a reference in your life to convey his message. You know, honey, when you go to work and you talk to your boss and this and this and this, and he or she says this and you're unhappy about it, what do you do then? What do you feel then? What do you think then? Again, this may not work, but these are just ideas. These are just suggestions to help you break apart, get out of the current entangled mess of logic that you might already be in that you can't get past. So there's another suggestion. Um, A third suggestion, and this is probably more important than the other two, is that you get the other person, in your case, Joan, you get your husband to repeat what you said, or at least acknowledge it in a way that you can tell he understands what you're saying. Because so many people are just waiting for you to finish so they can get their words out. And what you want to do is make sure that he absorbs what you're saying. And what that means is you listen to the other person, really take it in and then say, so what you're saying is, and then you repeat it. Now you need to get him to do that. And you might have to ask the question, did you understand what I said? And if he says, yes, I understand. And here's what I'm going to say. You have to back him up and say, okay, if you understood what I said, what did I say? Just so I can hear myself through you, just so I can understand your perspective of what I'm saying. And that will help him be empathetic to the point where he can speak as if he were you and convey to you what he's hearing, because he may say something that doesn't make any sense. And you might go, whoa, that's not what I meant at all. Or that's not what I said at all. This is what I said. And there may be a misunderstanding that you could never get past. This may not be your challenge, Joan. I don't think it is. I think your challenge is a little deeper. But I'm just throwing these basic ideas out there first, just to make sure that you are applying things like this so that you can be heard and he can be heard. There needs to be a level of understanding on both sides, or at least seeking to understand as the seven habits teaches us seek to understand before trying to be understood. Okay. So what you're saying is that when I say this, you get angry. And when you get angry and I respond to that anger, so on and so on, you relay all the details back to them so that they actually feel that you've listened. You may not agree, but at least you've listened. So now let's go into the little bit uh, deeper part of this is what I think might be really happening here is that he doesn't want to be wrong. And being wrong, uh, it might be a reflection of his character. It might be a reflection of his intelligence. He might have trouble with his self-worth and self-esteem. You know, I'm not trying to put him down. Maybe he's not that at all. And he probably has more PhDs and degrees than I do. But, you know, I'm the emotional intelligence guy. I've been studying this for a long time. And if he really believes he's right, There has to be a mix of loving someone while conveying the message. And I'm worried that he might not be doing that. Meaning I'm worried that he might be trying to make himself right with you without love. Not saying he doesn't love you. I'm just saying when you have love in the mix, you convey a message to someone that includes the feeling of I support you. I think you're smart. I think you're beautiful. I mean, it doesn't have to be these specific things. I think you're worthy. You're important to me. And here's my perspective. Most arguments don't go that way. I know that. But there's a difference between saying, look, here's the problem. You are doing this wrong. You have a challenge with this. You can't do this right. You have problems here. You have problems there. You did this with your sister. You did this with your brother. You did this with your mother. If all of these accusations are coming at you, all this finger pointing, if that's happening with you, and there's not the foundation of love in there somewhere, 
then it's a little bit more mean spirited. I'm not saying he's trying to be mean. And, you know, we all do this. We all want to be right in our arguments. At least, you know, when we really want to convey information that we know we're right about, we want to get that message across and we all get caught up in the moment and we all get heated. Or, you know, most of us, I'm not speaking for everyone, but I think a lot of us can get really energized, really charged, and we convey information in a way that doesn't sound loving. And I get that. I mean, we're all capable of doing that. But the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to be aware and stay observant about how he's making you feel and stay focused on that. How is he making me feel right now? And in fact, figure out the moment he makes you feel bad. So what that means is when he says something, when you're in this argument or debate or whatever it is, and something comes out and suddenly you feel bad, A, I want you to identify the feeling. You have to identify the feeling or the emotion. The, what is the emotion? The emotion might be, I feel disrespected. I feel devalued. I feel untrusted. I feel unloved. There might be several emotions in there or one big one. And you just have to identify it and take a mental note of it. And the reason you want to do that is because you want to be able to bring that up as part of the conversation in the sense that you can say, you know, when we have these conversations, I'm not sure what happens, but at the end of the conversation, I feel, and then you say the emotion. And so what this does again, takes you out of the logic puzzle of the conversation or the argument and puts you in the space of the end result of how you're walking away. Because the, someone who has a loving energy towards you is going to feel concerned about that at some deep level. They may not in the moment, but if they love you, if they really care about you, eventually they're going to realize, gee, I don't want her to feel that way. I don't want her to feel like I disrespect her. And hopefully after the argument energy has dissipated, he will come along and say, look, I don't, I don't want to make you feel disrespected. I'm not trying to do that at all. I'm sorry if that's how it came across. I don't want you to feel small. I don't want you to feel inferior. That's not my goal. I just feel like I needed to convey this because I knew I was right about it. I'm not saying that's exactly the best thing he could say, but at least he's acknowledging and wants you to understand that he still loves you and he doesn't want you to feel bad. And that would be a good thing. So even if he still thinks he's right, for him to come back and say, look, I, I never wanted you to feel that way. That's not my goal. I just wanted to convey that I believe this is right and this is why. Because at least if you hear that, then you'll realize that the bigger picture still exists. The bigger picture of love and emotional connection and commitment is still there so that you don't lose the foundation of what you have. Because what I'm worried about, and this is kind of where I'm leading with this a little bit, is that he might have some narcissistic tendencies and I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not diagnosing here and I could be completely wrong because, you know, some people want to be right and it, it hurts them in some way that they're not right. But if he has a narcissistic tendency because he went to college, because he achieved a lot of things that no matter what, his mind is closed to new ideas and new thoughts and that he believes he knows everything that that's a narcissistic tendency then you have less of a chance of being able to convey information to him and be heard. And this is why I gave you the other suggestions is that it's important that you find out if he understands you. And he does that by repeating what you said and really absorbing it. I mean, he has to be in a space of, so what you're saying is that when I do this, you get angry. And when you do that, I say this and that makes you upset. I mean, that is the gears turning. You want those gears to turn. You want to see him thinking about it. He may still want to be right, and that's fine, but you at least want to see him thinking about it. If he doesn't go, oh, no, 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 I don't want to, you know, that's ridiculous. I, I'm not even going to address that. Then those are the narcissistic tendencies that might be inside somewhere. Tendency doesn't mean narcissism. Tendency just means there are behaviors that he might be doing that might be a little narcissistic. I'm not saying you should tell him that. <laughs> I'm just saying that it's good to be aware of that because if that's the case, that's when the ego gets involved. If he's got that big ego and he doesn't want it crushed, we go right back to don't hurt my self-worth, don't hurt my self-esteem, don't insult my intelligence because I'll feel stupid, I'll feel inferior. 
and I'm deathly afraid to go there. That happens a lot, especially when there is narcissism involved, is that it usually represents a very, very low self-worth and self-esteem and a lot of fear that if they're exposed, it can be crushing, it can be devastating, and they don't know how to handle it. So they keep themselves way up, always trying to look right, always looking smart, always looking superior, and allowing nobody to bring them down. Which is why it's important for you to connect at the emotional level again, because you can't win logical arguments with anyone that displays those kind of tendencies. You can't because they're good at it. They already know how to talk circles around you. So what you need to do is reconnect with your own emotions. Where am I? What do I feel? And then convey what you feel and then say the following. And if you've been listening a while, you've heard me say this before. Do you know that when you say that to me, it makes me feel X, you know, fill in the blank. It makes me feel disrespected. And he says, well, that's not my intention. That's not what I mean. You're just taking it wrong. You know, whatever he says, you say, I understand. But do you know that you're doing that? Do you know that when you say that I feel disrespected? And again, if he comes back and says, well, I have no control over how you feel. That's your choice you can say, that's fine. I can understand that. But do you know that's what happens inside of me? So what you're doing is continuing to redirect, continuing to refocus back on the emotional state that you're in. Because you may not be able to win the logical argument, but you can certainly convey the emotional state that you're in. And when there's a loving energy in the conversation, a loving person, someone who really cares about you, Again, may not do it in the moment, but later will come to you and say, I never wanted you to feel that way. In the heat of the moment, it's hard to access. But later on, they're going to feel bad for making you feel bad. So the idea is to redirect it back to the emotion. Do you know that when you say that, it makes me feel this emotion? Now, if he says, yes, I do know that, but that's your problem or something like that, which is really cold. (laughs) But if he says that, then you have another response. And that response is, Knowing that I feel disrespected or unloved or not worthy in your eyes or inferior, knowing that I feel that, knowing that I hurt because of that, does it make you feel bad that I feel bad? Now, you may get a number of responses from that question, but the idea is to help him connect with your emotions too. Again, not easy in the moment, but at least have him recognize what you're going through so that it can be talked about later when the heat has cooled and when you're in a better space to talk about it Uh, because you'll probably want to mention to him anyone listening who is dealing with somebody that can talk circles around you and is always better with the logic and better at putting you, you in your place and keeping you below them in some way shape or form you can't win the logic argument but you can convey that how they talk to you hurts you And you can even say, I'm not sure how you do it, but every time we have a conversation, I feel bad. And I don't know exactly how you do that, but it hurts. And I just want to know if you are intending to hurt me. These might be a little confrontational too, but if you convey this to someone who cares about you, they're not going to want to hurt you. But if you mention this to someone who may not have that loving energy, what happens is you find out where they are. You find out who they are. You find out what their feelings are toward you. Hopefully for you, Joan, you have a loving husband that will realize, oh, you know what? I guess I do talk to you differently than I do my clients. I mean, of course I do because I'm a professional, but I might find myself treating my clients with a little more empathy than I do you. And if that's the case, if I were you, Joan, I would want to know why. And I'm kind of hesitant to give you that information because My girlfriend has been known to do this to me. (laughs) She will say something like, okay, you're supposed to be this master communicator and you're supposed to be this amazing coach. She made up these words. And uh, if a client came to you and they said this, are you telling me that you would say the same thing to your client as you're saying to me? And so she paints me in these corners (laughs) where she makes up this scenario And now I'm suddenly back in my coaching role, in my professional hat, and I have to think about what I would do or say in the coaching role. Fortunately, there's a lot of times where I would be the same, 
But of course I'm human and I get triggered and there's other things going on inside my head where I don't want to be the coach during an argument. I don't want to be that person all the time. It does help. I mean, it does help for me to be more present and be more understanding, but sometimes you just lose it. Sometimes you're just upset and you want to get it out because it's a buildup of emotional energy inside of you. I want you to be okay with that sometimes. Hopefully you're in a a relationship where you can just lose it every now and then. I don't mean yell and scream and throw things. I just mean it's okay to convey what's going on inside of you. In fact, I, I released a lot of pent up energy to my girlfriend a long time ago when um, she felt very assertive or aggressive toward me. I felt a lot of finger pointing. I felt a lot of forward aggression toward me. And I finally just, instead of arguing, I just said, look, back off. You just need to back off because I'm feeling very intimidated. I'm feeling very bullied. You need to back off. And that was my stance. And I wasn't going to take anything less than that. If she had pushed me further, I would have just walked out the door and said, I got to get away from you. You're just too aggressive. Sometimes that needs to happen. I mean, they need to be aware that they are being intimidating or bullying. I'm not saying my girlfriend's a bully or intimidating, but there are times where someone wants to be so in your face that you really need to stand up and go into survival mode, go into that fight or flight and push someone back verbally and say, you've gone too far. You're pushing me beyond my limits. I don't feel comfortable with this because you're not being very nice or you're not giving me a chance to explain or you're not listening. I feel unheard. And this is my last suggestion for you, Joan, is you need to be clear that you are being heard. And I said this earlier about, you know, making sure that he says, okay, so what you're saying is this. And then he repeats what you said. If he can repeat what you said, then at least he's making an effort to understand. But if he doesn't do that, it's vital that you convey that you feel like you're not being heard. Now, he may say the same thing. If he's a good arguer or a bad arguer, he's going to say, well, I feel like I'm not being heard. That's another narcissistic tendency. I hate to say I'm not saying he's a narcissist, but a lot of narcissists will do that uh, or at least manipulators. And he may not have those intentions. But um, it's good to be aware that those behaviors uh, could be prevalent in him where you say, well, I feel like I'm not being heard. He'll argue back the same thing, redirecting it back on you. All those redirects back on you keep pushing you down, keep pushing you down, keep taking away your power. And that's what you need to be aware of. That's why I said you need to be aware of the emotion that comes up in you so you can use that emotion as a way to convey what's happening inside of you so that maybe he'll be a little bit more sensitive when you have the next conversation or next argument. You want him to understand the feelings that you have so that you can access his loving, caring, and compassion. Hopefully he has those three and hopefully he'll be more supportive. And hopefully, yes, even though he may feel right and want to say that he's right and will feel crushed in some way if you think he's wrong, even though that may exist, he should hopefully have that emotional connection with you enough to approach these things a little bit lighter, a little bit more uh, sensitive to your needs, because you're not the same person as him. If you were, he would lose the argument. He would feel inferior. Or you'd both be butting heads and both feel so righteous and both be so angry at each other that no one would be on top and no one would be on the bottom and you'd both be unhappy with each other and you'd probably just get a divorce because you couldn't stand each other. And I'm saying that because when he is conveying information to you and you're conveying information to him and you take into account that you're not the same people, you can say that to him too. We're not the same person. We don't argue the same. I have emotions that get affected and you need to know about them. And then you can follow it up and say, just like I won't bring up some sensitive topic for him. You know what I'm saying? It's like bringing up the analogy that makes sense to him. Like if he went through some sensitive thing that he doesn't want to talk about, like, you know what? I never bring that up because I know it's sensitive to you. So the way that you're talking to me, knowing that it's sensitive to me, could you please take that into account? Could you please talk to me? a little bit slower, a little bit more methodical. Could we please interact instead of you just talking down to me, pointing your finger and making me feel less than worthy? By you conveying your emotional state, it gives him an opportunity to understand how he's doing that. 
he may not take responsibility for it. And that might be a problem because you want someone who at least feels bad for making you feel bad. But it's important that you convey that, you know, when we have these conversations, I always feel bad and you always say, I don't measure up. That doesn't make me feel loved. And just see what he says. It doesn't make me feel loved. And then if he says, well, honey, of course I love you. Well, if you love me, please know that when you say that, it makes me feel unloved. And then you'll find out where he is inside and you'll find out how he's going to treat you from that point on. And hopefully he'll be honest. And let me just close with this, Joan. You said that you need to give him your full attention and time. You know, that tells me that he's probably very needy and probably insecure inside of him. And so um, he might need some help to get through that. I'm not saying you should be the one to help him, but, you know, I went through that when I was younger. I, I felt very insecure, very clingy, very needy. I needed my girlfriend's time and I needed all of her time. If she went out with family or friends, I felt left out and I, I got jealous and I missed her and I wanted her back. And it was very unhealthy. It was a very unhealthy place. And I would probably even make her feel guilty for doing those things in subtle ways. And so these are dysfunctions that he may need to work with inside of him. You know, hopefully he has some tools to work with insecurity and dependencies and, and a lack of self-worth and lack of self-esteem. But it's hard to be your own therapist. It really is. So maybe he needs to talk to someone about that. I don't know how you'd convey that, especially if he's at all narcissist and he thinks, what are you talking about? There's nothing wrong with me. Uh, hopefully he'll understand that these are unhealthy dependencies. And maybe that's something you need to convey eventually is that, you know what? It's unhealthy for me to not be able to go out with my friends. And it's unhealthy for you to get upset if I don't spend all my time and attention on you. It's unhealthy. And he may say, well, of course I want to spend all my time and attention on you with you because I love you. And again, you'll get into some logic argument that makes you feel small or makes you feel unimportant or insignificant. And he'll be in his righteousness trying to make you understand that unhealthy behavior is, is healthy. So it might be important. And this is really my last suggestion. It might be really important for you to note the particular behaviors that he does not necessarily during the arguments, but note the behaviors that seem to be a little dysfunctional, like him wanting all the time and attention from you. That seems like a dysfunction. You know, look that up, read about it. My husband never leaves me alone or my husband always wants me to spend time with him. And I don't know if this is true, but maybe he gets jealous when I'm out with my friends or maybe he gets upset when I'm not spending enough time with him. You know, read about this stuff, find out what you can so that when you have a conversation, you can bring it up saying, you know, what? you make me feel bad because you say I'm, I'm not spending enough time with you. But in relationships, we're supposed to have our own time and spend time together. You know, you'll probably lose that argument, too. But it's good to be educated on this stuff so that you're not totally powerless. And a few of the other things that you said, again, lead me to looking at narcissistic tendencies. And you may want to look that up, too, of not being able to say anything in front of others because it'll make him feel bad or he'll give you the lecture later. That sounds like a parent child relationship. And that's something that you may want to mention. I don't want you to be my parent. And he may say, well, stop acting like a child. Again, that's a parent thing to say. You don't want somebody like that. You don't want somebody who puts you in your place. Like you're a child. You want someone to treat you as an equal and you have to let him know that, Hey, look, I chose you and you chose me. And I want to be in a relationship with an equal adult. If you can't treat me like an adult, then why are you with me? And you said it perfectly. I feel more controlled than loved. And so that may have to come out too. All of these things may have to come out eventually. I know you said you're afraid of, you know, he makes all the money, but uh, you're kind of intimating maybe you can't make an exit strategy or an escape plan here. You may want to think about and this is just a little side comment here. If you're thinking about leaving, but you know you can't because of money issues, then it's important that you start to bring the idea of making your own money into this relationship and start building your own foundation. Because if all your reliance, all your dependency is on this other person and this business that you have together, and there's no way out because you'll be broke, 
it's time to think a little differently. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying that's the path for you. I'm not saying that you have to do that. I'm just saying it's hard to get into empowerment when somebody else has all the power. And so you need to start rebuilding that power inside of you. Money is one thing, but you know, there's also rebuilding your connections, rebuilding your friends, rebuilding your support system, which I have a feeling has lessened over the years because he seems to want to have all your time. And there's a dominating aspect of that that I don't like. And if he's been controlling all your time and isolates you from the rest of the world and your friends and your connections and your family, that's a problem. That's a huge red flag. You need to be very aware that you might be in a more controlling relationship than you initially believed. So you just want to be aware of that. If that's the case, listen to Love and Abuse. Go to loveandabuse.com and listen to the episodes on emotionally abusive relationships and find out if you're in something a little deeper. This is all I have for you today, Joan. Thank you so much for writing. There's a lot more to talk about. Just don't have the time. Thank you again. I wish you luck. We'll be right back. Right a few weeks ago, I got my Everly Well home lab test. It was the heart health test. And I said I was going to go through with it and see what results I get just because I haven't had you know, my blood checked for some of these things ever. <laughs> if you don't know what Everly Well is, it's the amazing at-home wellness test that helps you better understand your health. I received mine, like I said, a few weeks ago, and I tested myself for the heart health test. And a few days ago, I got the results. And coincidentally, it it was funny. I was actually sitting in the waiting room at my doctor's office and the results came in on my phone. So I'm checking my emails and I said, wow, this is perfect. I can show my doctor these results. And so my doctor calls me in and I showed her the results that I got from the test. And she was fascinated by it. I'm not sure if she heard about Everly Well or not, but what was interesting is that I said, hey, while I'm here, why don't I get a blood test and compare the results to the ones I got from Everly Well? And she said, that's a great idea. And so that's exactly what I did. I went and got my blood tested. And last time I got my blood tested, I was considered pre-diabetic. And I was like, pre how can I be pre-diabetic? I, I'm, I'm in pretty good health, but there's a number of reasons that happens. But uh, I decided to get the blood test and compare the numbers I got from Everly Well with the blood test. And I got to tell you, they were spot on. And so this made me feel so good knowing that I could get this test from home, send them a little sample, and I get my results a few days later, and I never have to leave the comfort of my home. It was just really nice. And it was also reassuring that the test results were the same. So you heard it here. (laughs) I was able to verify that the at-home lab tests from Everlywell are spot on. They're accurate. They offer more than 30 different at-home lab tests from fertility to food sensitivity to thyroid and the one I took, heart health. And each one comes with super easy to follow instructions. And every test, like the one I sent in, is physician reviewed. And of course, the shipping is free. They give you a a shipping label with it. They're personalized, they're easy to understand, and they describe exactly what's going on. Whatever you get, they explain it for you. Plus, you can reach out to them and say, hey, can you help me understand this a little bit more? In fact, I had to do that. I wanted to learn more about my HbA1c, which is my blood sugar level. And it was slightly high. It was past optimal and was getting into that mm, warning range. So this tells me I need to make some changes in my life. And that's what Everly Well does for you. It helps you understand what you're doing right, what you might need to improve upon, and what definitely needs to be followed up with a physician. So I'm already making changes. I'm already going in the right direction to take care of my health, including perhaps laying off some of the sweets. (laughs) I'm not a big sweets guy anyway, but uh, if you put it in front of me, I'm probably going to eat the whole thing. So I just have to be careful with that. And 
Maybe I'll watch some of my pasta intake too. <laughs> I want you to start better understanding your health like I did. Check out Everly Well today and you can get an Everly Well at home lab test for 15% off. Just visit everlywell.com forward slash brain. Enter the code brain during checkout so that you get 15% off your test. That's everlywell.com forward slash brain and use the code word brain for your 15% off. Everly Well at Home Lab Tests, your answers, your way. Welcome back. I just want to say one last thing about someone who believes they have all the answers. Uh, I think it's okay if you believe that. My only warning to you is if you believe that's true, if you think you have all the answers, is to look at your results and realize that when those around you are unhappy or upset in some way, that you play a role in that upset. You may know you're right, but when you can't open your mind to the fact that someone else's emotional state is affected by your presence and you believe they need to be fixed and it's all their responsibility then you're not taking responsibility for your role in the relationship. And on top of that, you're proudly showing your ignorance in how relating to people even works. So I'm only talking to those that believe they know it all and think everyone else is the problem. That's showing ignorance in how relating to people even works. And let me put that simply. Because you're in someone else's life, you affect their emotional state, good or bad, right or wrong, and even though you may believe you are 100% right, don't forget to communicate that in a way that shows love for the other person. Now, this is when you have two functional, emotionally healthy people that want to make things work and not when one or both of you is deceiving or lying or trying to hurt the other. In relationships like that, the typical relationship rules go out the window. They don't apply when both aren't following the guidelines to create a healthy relationship. And if you want to know the guidelines, go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and look up the episode called 10 Ways, or something like this, 10 Ways to Stop Your Relationship from Slipping into Dysfunction. And also listen to every episode of Love and Abuse, my other podcast. Relationships take inner growth, empathy, sympathy, supporting and nurturing, and reciprocation. They're complex and they're also rewarding. They're painful and also pleasurable. They represent a giant portion of the human experience because you always learn about yourself when someone else is in your life. We just have to be careful of those who only think about themselves when someone else is in their life. Those are the people that don't seem to care who they hurt. All they care about is that they get what they want. And when you're around someone who only wants what they want and doesn't care enough to see that you are hurting because of it, or they don't seem to mind drowning you in their consistent verbal pummeling, then you have to seriously consider what the rest of your life looks like if you don't take a stand or make a change. You're not here to submit to people or be their children. You have parents for that. And even that relationship has a finite period of time where you stop being treated like a child. You're an adult who wants to be treated fairly by another adult. Sure, you can have fun like a child, but unless you're being awful, you should not be reprimanded for doing the best you can unless you aren't trying. Then you may need to be treated like an unruly, rebellious child because perhaps you're being selfish. I think we all need to try. We, we need to keep working on our relationships and keep working on ourselves. And that's really how we work on a relationship. You work on yourself to work on the relationship because you need to bring the best version of you into that relationship. And then when someone we love feels hurt or they're in stress or they're going through something, we have to realize that we affect their mood. We affect their emotions. And even though we may not be responsible for it, what we do and say can go a long way. Like I had somebody comment in the Facebook group, if you're not familiar with it, it's the Overwhelmed Brain Empowerment Group in Facebook. Feel free to join. Uh, you got to be 18 or over. But they posted a comment about dealing with a relative that made them so angry and was lying and the relative was just being mean. 
and they weren't sure how to deal with this relative. They were being nice. And then suddenly um, this person comes back and is really just awful. And so I knew from the context from what else she said that uh, if she came back with uh, an emotionally triggered response, that it would probably ignite this relative even further and continue to hurt feelings. And I didn't want it to go in that direction. I prefer closure. And sometimes to get closure, yes, you can honor yourself and say, how dare you treat me that way? I'm not going to allow that. You can do it that way. Or you can go the complete opposite way and say, you know what? I love you and I I don't know what happened and I'm not sure how we got so off track, but I just wanted to let you know whatever I said or did, I am sorry. And I would love to have us back to where we can talk again and connect again, but I just want to let you know that and then walk away. Don't expect them to forgive you. Don't expect them to say, well, I'm sorry too. Just put the ball in their court. And I love doing that. Just making closure in my life, putting the ball in their court so that I've done my part. And some people don't like that. Some people say, well, I'm not wrong and I'm not sorry. And I ask, well, how long do you want to prolong this? And how long are you going to carry it around as this negativity in your body, in your heart? Because if you want to continue carrying it around, absolutely. By all means, continue avoiding that closure in any way possible. And, you know, think about all the things that you want to say to them or do to them and how you can't wait to get back at them, you can absolutely do that. I won't take that away from you. I just prefer closure. I just prefer saying, you know what? I don't know where it went wrong, but I'm sorry. And I love you. And I would love to have our relationship back to the way it was, or even better than it was. I just know that I don't want to argue or fight. And I take responsibility for whatever I did and whatever I said. Even when I know I didn't do anything wrong, I'd rather just go that route just to show that I'm ready to rebuild the bridge. So maybe that'll help you too, depending on what's going on in your life. Thank you so much for joining me today. We'll be right back. I'll say some goodbyes and my thank yous and my final words after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank our sponsor, Everlywell. Go to everlywell.com forward slash brain and enter the code word brain during checkout to get your 15% discount. I also want to thank Brad. Brad surprised me with a generous donation and I was surprised because we've been going back and forth and he helped me out with the uh, safe empowerment system for social anxiety And he wanted to show his appreciation and he just sent me a generous donation. So thank you, Brad. I am touched. Thanks again, Brad. And I also want to thank I Am Avanti for their iTunes review. I Am Avanti said, I loved how he asks amazing questions to which we never think of any answers. (laughs) We only keep being afraid of those questions. What I Am Avanti is saying is that uh, there's episodes where I talk about asking yourself questions. And one of those questions might be, well, why is that a problem? Or how is that a problem? Or what specifically is causing that problem? And just keep asking yourself questions like that. It's a pretty good technique that instead of just giving you a suggestion on what to do, like some of that was in today's episode, I actually help you access the resources inside you so that you can figure out what to do for yourself. And I am Avanti loves that. So there are episodes where I help you ask questions of yourself. And I think those are more effective than most of my episodes. So you'll hear some more of those coming up. Thank you, I am Avanti. Thanks for your review. And of course, I'd like to thank all the supporters of The Overwhelmed Brain over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Those are people that give either a single donation or are part of the monthly membership site over there where they get all kinds of private episodes and workbooks and videos. In fact, I just created a 20-minute video. If you're in the patron program and you haven't seen it, Go to the episodes link and you'll see the 20 minute video I created in there regarding why you aren't getting the results you want. And uh, I think it's pretty interesting. You'll you'll probably like it. So check it out at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And uh, all patron members, there's an update to the website coming up soon because eh, it's getting a little antiquated and it's a little challenging to find things in there. So I'm going to work on that, get it updated, and um, continuing to put content 
on that site for all patron members. And thank you so much, anyone that's donated or has become a patron member. I appreciate you. And if you find value in this show and you want to give back, go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And like I said earlier with uh, Brad, he helped me with the safe empowerment system. And that's over at quietbegins.com. I created that system for social anxiety and it has evolved into anybody with any anxiety. And um, it's a really powerful subliminal system to help you through your anxiety moments. I mean, like in real time. So if you're starting to experience anxiety, you play one of these three to seven minute audios and it walks you through it. Plus there's like master classes in there too, where I get experts to share their advice on working through anxiety, defeating anxiety, getting through it and having a much better life without it. That's over at quietbegins.com. It's called the safe empowerment system. Hope you get a chance to take a look. And finally, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. And in conclusion, I'd like to say that there are some people that you are going to meet in your life or that you know in your life that you simply will not be able to get through to. You simply will never, ever be able to make happy. You simply will never be able to have a healthy conversation with. And when you run across those people, there has to be a level of acceptance in you that the relationship that you have will never, ever go any farther than it has. And some people might say, there's always a chance. There's always a a possibility that the relationship can improve or or that they can change and see the error of their ways, or I can change and see the error of my ways. There's always a chance. And I say, yes, of course. But I like to ask, how long am I going to go through the strife and the tension and the stress until I finally say, you know what? There's nothing I can do. Nothing. There's nothing I can do to change this relationship. There's nothing I can do to change them. And I'm pretty staunch on my beliefs and my values. There's nothing I can do. So I'm going to accept that this relationship will never get any better, ever. And if they start showing up in a way that I don't appreciate, I have to accept that that's how they show up. And if I don't like it, then I should just ignore it or get away. But I shouldn't continue complaining about it. I shouldn't continue looking at their behavior and hoping they change and just accept it. I think I said this a couple episodes ago, but it's worth repeating here because it's important to understand that some people will never change. Some relationships will never change. And when you get that through your head and you come to an acceptance that this will never change or they will never change, then what you do is let go of all the methods of control that you tried to implement, all the ways that you tried to change it. And when that's not in the picture, you might be surprised that the relationship changes all by itself. Because people sometimes need a chance to figure it out on their own instead of being told what to do. People can do this. I mean, you can empower people to do this by trying to stay out of their way. And some people get it and some people don't. That's true. Some people need guidance and advice. But some people, when they get guidance or advice, they rebel. They show the opposite of the advice or the guidance or the techniques or the steps that you want them to take, they'll do the opposite or they'll ignore it because they don't like being told what to do. But when you give someone enough space to at least try to figure it out on their own, if there's any type of moral compass or moral center in there, if there's any type of empathetic connection, if there's any type of heart in there, they're going to realize that it's a lot easier to get along with people and love people and be kind to people than it is to be mean to them. But what ends up happening is at one point in their life, they're rebellious or unruly or just hard to be around and the rest of us get triggered. So we yell back or we argue. Then the other person starts to realize this is how life is and that's how life goes from that point on. But when you start to change your reactions to who they are and how they act, you may end up getting other reactions because they finally have the space in their own mind without your trigger, without your defensiveness to realize what they're doing might be hurtful. And if they can connect with that, 
there's an opportunity for them to heal and grow through it and learn new behavior. So if you find yourself trying to control someone else's behavior and you want them to change, sometimes you do have to take a step back and just see if they'll change on their own. You'll get one of two results. They'll get worse or they'll get better. But if you're trying to control and trying to change and you never see the changes, then what you're doing is probably pointless. This is when you maybe need to take a step back and see what happens. And if you have a hard time doing that, just keep an open mind. That will help you step into your power. And it'll also help you be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. Amazing.